So we'll start with the agenda. Uh, what I'll do first is give a little bit of context uh, of uh, the problem space uh, that we are trying to solve, how we moved from batch to streaming and why, and high level architecture. And then we'll dive uh, deeper into the use case, the stateful use case that uh, we tried uh, and implemented using Apache Beam uh, with Flink Runner, some of the design choices we made and operational consideration. And then we'll close with uh, challenges and learnings and finally Q&A. So to start with uh, context, uh, like, uh, I'll start with the very basic, like what is Clickstream? Uh, most of you are already aware it is essentially user actions uh, which are captured through web websites or products or mobile apps. Uh, these user actions are uh, ingested through uh, Kafka and then they are processed to enrich with additional details which are not uh, captured at the front end or application side. So we do uh, some of the stateless enrichment like ip to geo which basically says uh, uh, what is the location from where user is uh, uh, accessing the application or user agent passing which gives us details of what kind of machines uh, or browser user is using uh, and we also do stateful enrichment which we'll talk in depth today uh, is assigning series of actions in a session and after these enrichments are done uh, they are essentially distributed uh, and stored for various use cases like analytics, user engagement, experimentation, improving user experience, machine learning, fraud, etc. So with this context, uh, I will share some of the scaling requirement that we had uh, while developing the solution. So we're receiving around 2 billion clicks every day at Intuit across uh, several products. Uh, it is peaking uh, with peak around 60,000 transactions or events per second uh, and more than 40 uh, million sessions uh, daily. And the requirement for latency we had was uh, for stateless, it should be minimal uh, under one second. And for stateful, uh, up to 60 seconds. Uh, I'll go into detail on why 60 seconds. Uh, and with this context, uh, I would start with uh, batch versus streaming. So. Initially, uh, or let's say before we started the solutions, the state uh, of clickstream processing into it was, was batch. And there uh, we essentially consumed uh, like the data from Kafka was returned to a position file store. And from there, a batch processing job used to ingest the data every hour. Uh, and then it was written in output in high tables from where batch consumers used to consume it. So it, took a while for consumers to actually get that data and make uh, uh, use of it. So up, it had up to four hours of latency. And for batch processing, the state used to, uh, we used uh, an external state store, uh, which was HBase, and it was pretty expensive to maintain. Uh, so going from batch to streaming, the architecture is very simplified where uh, a stack of Beam uh, on top of Flink Runner, which is deployed on Kubernetes, uh, essentially processes the, this data in real time with one minute latency. And in addition to reducing the latency where real time consumers can get data under a minute uh, and start using it, uh, and batch uh, consumers SLA is also reduced to two hours from four hours. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also leverage local state store to store the state for stateful processing uh, and overall reduce the cost by 70%. So uh, now going into stateful processing. Uh, so I'll start with uh, the use case that we are trying to solve to get give more context, and then uh, we'll see how we solved using uh, Beam. So the use case is essentially uh, assigning session to user uh, events. So what makes a user session? Essentially, uh, series of user activities uh, which are if not 30 minutes apart they are supposed to get the same session so when a user clicks on website uh, and the clickstream events are emitted uh, those events should get assigned a session uh, but if there's 30 minute gap between two events a new session should be started 
And similarly, we had another criteria for 12 hour maximum. So let's say there is no 30 minute gap between two consecutive events, then a maximum duration that a session should be assigned is for 12 hours. These are pretty much industry standard for session. Uh, but uh, this uh, assignment works when events are coming in order. But it is possible that events arrive late. In that case, uh, how do we need to assign the sessions? So in this example, you see that uh, all of these activities are from a single user. So event one, two, and four arrived uh, consequently. Uh, and then there is a 30 minute gap after which event five and six arrived. So the first three events got assigned to session one and five and six got assigned to session two. But after that, there was an activity done between two and three for some reason, network delay or connection issue or something. It arrived uh, late after activity six. So even though the event timestamp was uh, between activity two and three, it arrived after user activity six. In that case also, this uh, event technically belongs to session one. So how do we achieve uh, late arriving? Like how do we process late arriving events in real time? Because uh, these two uh, events are already processed before this event arrives in the system. So in that case, uh, we leverage the sorry about that. In that case, we leverage the time domains uh, that Beam already exposes. Uh, and many real time processing framework uh, has this concept of processing time versus event time. So uh, event time is essentially when uh, the data itself is created at the producer end, uh, while processing time is the system clock when the event is processed. So processing time is the simplest notion of time where no coordination between system and stream need to be done. So it gives the best performance and lower latency, but it doesn't give determinism. Like for example, in the previous use case, if we had used processing time, uh, then the user activity three would have been assigned to session two, while technically it belongs to session one. So, uh, and the other downsides of processing time is uh, uh, it cannot handle out of order event or late arriving events, which is why we choose to process this data using event time. So, given all this requirement and consideration, how does this translate into uh, Apache Beam code? So, we actually used state and timer based approach uh, where we Essentially, in a Pardo, which is supposed to do the actual business logic of assigning sessions, we initialize the state. So here, we initialized a current session state and completed sessions. And then we have initialized a state expiry, which is supposed to be responsible to expire the state. So state and timer uh, API, we found it is more flexible and easier to debug compared to windowing approaches, which are more abstract. Uh, but in our use case, we wanted more control over the logic in case requirements change over the time. And if we need to make the session calculation, calculation logic uh, more complex or add more criteria. Uh, but with more flexibility, the responsibility of cleaning up state is also on the developer's part. So we had to explicitly write code uh, using timer to expire the state after it is no, no longer needed. Uh, so this is just a high level overview of how uh, the beam state and timer APIs are used. But how does this session assignment actually work in real time? So that I'll show next. Uh, basically, what we are doing is uh, in the process element, like this is a, a session in which Pardu uh, illustrated. So when event comes to uh, the process element, we first put it in a buffer. And when the first event arrives, we basically set a buffer expiry of 60 seconds. So all the events that arrive, we put it into buffer. At the end of the 60 second, the buffer expiry timer is called, and then it reads all the events from the buffer. And after reading all these events, it basically orders them based on event timestamp. So if there are any out of order events within that one minute period, that gets realigned. Uh, and then uh, we assign user sessions to them uh, using. So the state uh, user session state stores the current session as well as completed sessions. So if there are any late arriving events, uh, that are that are part of the 60 seconds window, then uh, we look through the completed sessions and figure out which session that event belongs to. Uh, and after assigning the sessions, those events are emitted to the output. But along with that, we also set 
another expiry time or for state. So for our requirement, we have max allowed lateness set to two hours. So an event arriving after two hours get a, doesn't get uh, added to the completed session, but it gets assigned a new session. So uh, here we talk about this state, like event buffer as well as user session. So theoretically, all of this is abstracted from the user uh, by Apache Beam and the runner that uh, we use. But internally, uh, it requires a lot more consideration on how we, uh, what state we use and what kind of backend we use. So I'll talk about uh, Flink runner in this example, but uh, majority of the runners that Beam supports have similar concepts where it has multiple pods. Uh, and in our case, the input is Kafka. So each pod reads, pod or node essentially reads from one or more partitions from a topic. And then a key by operation is performed because this sessionization or stateful operation needs to be done for each user. So this key by essentially gives uh, or sends events from one user to one task manager. And for that uh, task manager, all of the state that it maintains, it is maintained locally on that machine itself. Uh, and there are two ways this state can be stored in Flink runner. One is the file system, which essentially uses the heap. Uh, and the other one is LoxDB, which is off heap as well as disk. So LoxDB is a little bit slower than file system, but it supports much larger state. We uh, currently went with LoxDB because our state size was larger, but eventually we might consider a uh, file system if the state size, state size reduces. Uh, but given the distributed nature of the state where state is local to the uh, node where processing happens, it is highly scalable while providing excellent performance. So uh, this was key part in reducing the cost uh, for, while moving from batch to streaming, where in batch we had the states for a centralized state store externally and via HTTP or other uh, access mechanism, we had to go out on the network and call that state store to get the state. Well, here that happens on the same node itself. Uh, but uh, since a key by operation is performed and state is stored locally, if the key distribution is not even, uh, then it uh, represents a challenge where uh, data or state skew can happen. Uh, in our case, uh, from the performance test testing, we didn't need to do any sorting to uh, make the key distribution even, but sorting is one of the way that we considered uh, to avoid the skew if it happens. Next, I'll share a few operational aspects that helped us run this pipeline reliably in production. So there are two kinds of health that we look for uh, in the streaming pipeline. One is the processing health, whether the processing logic is working as expected. Uh, in that case, we essentially made some of the basic metrics like whether the event is processed successfully, uh, skipped or failed, or whether the event itself was invalid, how, how much latency it is to process every single event. And we alert on percentage of failures versus skipped event uh, if they are increasing, and uh, if latency is higher for extended period. The second aspect of monitoring, which helps us uh, uh, identify issues in the pipeline is the detecting pipeline issues, whether even though the processing health is fine, but what if uh, the consumer lag is increasing or input is greater than output, so pipeline is not keeping up with the traffic, uh, which is similar to consumer lag, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the two can work for alerts and number of restarts in the pipeline. So in addition to uh, the metrics and monitoring, uh, one other criteria that uh, uh, we had to tune was checkpointing. So checkpointing is essentially a mechanism in a streaming pipeline, which ensures that uh, between restarts, the data is not lost, uh, state is not lost, and pipeline resumes from where it was after the restart. So this needs to be, uh, this diagram is specifically from Flink runner, uh, but uh, again, the checkpointing concept is very similar across multiple uh, runners that Beam supports. Uh, it needs to be tuned based on use case and required guarantees. Like if the requirement is for exactly once or if there's a large state, then checkpoint uh, could take longer and it needs to be tuned accordingly. In our case, uh, we uh, the requirement 
suffice to have at least once guarantee and a certain bit of reprocessing of events or duplicate events were uh, fine. So we went with 10 minute interval and incremental checkpoints, which RocksDB supports. Uh, and that helped us uh, stabilize this pipeline prod uh, for long duration. Next, uh, I'd like to share some of the challenges we faced at learnings from moving from processing uh, this data from batch to streaming. So the first one is visibility into state. So the state that we talked about is actually serialized in binary format. And then during checkpoint, it is stored into a file system, but that is also in a binary format. So it is not easy to look into that state uh, and figure out whether uh, the data is getting cleaned up as expected, especially when we observe that the state size is growing over time, even when the data that is coming in is not growing. So those kind of issues was not easy to uh, address or figure out. Uh, the second one is uh, state compatibility is currently not guaranteed across versions, version upgrades by Beam. And this is one of the challenges because uh, in the current use case, we can live with uh, uh, letting go of state and resetting state uh, during upgrades, which doesn't happen that frequently. But we are looking into use cases where state needs to be supported for extended period, like one year or two years, in which case uh, we would need to solve this. Uh, and the third one is uh, limited blogs with deep dives in Apache Beam. So, uh, Beam provides an abstraction layer where we can run uh, a streaming pipeline across multiple runners, but there are still aspects that Beam does itself, like reading and writing the data. Uh, so specifically Kafka IO that is Beam itself has implemented, uh, uh, but there's not enough uh, deep dives or community blogs, which gives us more details on the gotchas or things that we look for uh, when we scale and when we encounter different use cases. Uh, but along with these challenges, we also learned a few important lessons, which are first is the performance testing. So what we realized is initially we started with synthetic data uh, to do the performance test, uh, trying to mimic what the production uh, data would look like. But our performance test and when running that uh, pipeline against production data uh, gave very significantly different results. So at the end, we actually went with uh, production data with uh, masking and uh, uh, sanitization to do the performance testing itself uh, rather than using synthetic data. So uh, doing performance testing on production-like data uh, was useful and needed. And secondly, the frameworks that we are using and stream processing in general is uh, rapidly evolving. So there are a lot of bugs and improvements really, uh, that are fixed and released very frequently. So for example, the first thing that I mentioned in challenges was in visibility into state. We actually noticed while using earlier version of Beam that some of the internal state was not getting cleaned up uh, and it was a bug. And then uh, in the later release that was fixed. So even though we looked in our code uh, and we didn't find any issues, uh, there were actually issues in the framework that were later solved. So when identifying optimization area, uh, the code that the developer writes is not the only place to look for optimization. Uh, many times the framework itself has opportunities that needs to be addressed. Uh, so given this, uh, what we are currently working on, uh, one of the uh, items that we are working on currently is auto scaling, uh, where the traffic that we see in Clickstream, especially at Intuit, given the Tex, Talbotex product, uh, it is uh, very season based. So currently we are doing manual scaling because the Flink runner that we have doesn't currently support auto scaling. So Flink also is looking into uh, supporting auto scaling, but uh, on our side, we are also figuring out how do we anticipate the traffic and uh, deploy an auto scaling mechanism rather than relying uh, or doing manual scaling every time a peak happens. And the second one is to address the gap that Beam currently has, uh, which is state recovery and compatibility across versions. Uh, and also state schema evolution. We are pursuing this internally, but uh, we'll be engaging with the community to identify how we can contribute back to Beam. Uh, we are currently doing some POCs to figure out uh, how do we read the state and then modify it so it becomes available or basically becomes compatible across versions. Uh, and I'd like to close 
with uh, some of the contributions uh, or the blogs that Intuit, uh, my colleagues at Intuit has written on Beam uh, as well as stream processing. So the first one is uh, we face this issue with Kafka IO uh, where while reading from multiple topics, the performance was not as expected because the uh, rate of input data across these topics was different. And then we understood how the Beam Kafka IO works uh, and then uh, basically figured out what are the workarounds or what are the optimization mechanisms from configuration side we can do to actually leverage Beam Kafka IO with the performance that we made. So my colleague Antonio has written an uh, excellent blog post on this. Please uh, go and check it out. The second one is uh, this pipeline that I just talked about is one of the first pipeline for stream processing at Intuit. But since this pipeline, uh, Intuit has uh, made uh, a lot of investment in stream processing. And we actually have a stream processing platform on which this pipeline is deployed on. Uh, and it makes uh, or it makes a self-serve platform available to the users to build and deploy stream processing applications uh, on Beam and Fluent Stack. So this is an article that explains what stream processing platform is now by building it and its tech stack. And uh, some of my colleagues are talking at Beam Summit uh, in July on the same topic, which is uh, building the stream processing platform at Intuit using Beam and Fling, and also talking about a similar use case, which is also very high scale. Uh, so please uh, go and uh, support them and hear what Intuit is doing in stream processing space. And I'll that's pretty much it from the presentation side. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, let me know. And I'll happy to, happy to be happy to connect on LinkedIn for any further questions later on.